welcome to the quarterly webinar that's organized by Cure Parkinson's, General Parkinson's Disease and Van Andel Institute. Uh, today, the theme is Young Onset Parkinson's Disease. And soon you will hear that is actually a concept that can be discussed on its own for a long time, what is young onset. But it's also a very interesting and important topic in terms of how people with young onset Parkinson's are treated, what the underlying biology is, what the uh, special challenges are for those affected by Parkinson's earlier in life. So my name is Patrick Brunden. I'm in Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I'm going to chair this session. I'm going to ask all our panelists to introduce themselves. Before I do that, I just want to let everybody know you can ask questions and you can go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window and there you can pose your questions. We have over 200 people registered today, so we're going to have a lot of questions coming in. And therefore, we have a couple of people in the background who are helping us uh, go through these questions and trying to group them. We're not going to be able to answer all of them, but we'll try to do our best to answer the most uh, common and pressing issues. And we, actually they, because I'm just going to be the moderator, the ones who are going to answer these uh, will now introduce themselves. So I'm going to start uh, the way I see you in my window with you, Bart. Who are you, Bart? Thank you, Patrick. I'm uh, Bart Post. I'm a neurologist in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and uh, I focus my research and uh, clinical practice, uh, especially on young onset Parkinson's disease. Thank you. And Vele, tell us about yourself. Hi, Patrick. My name is Vele Arce. Um, I got diagnosed back in 2010 at the age of 38 with young onset Parkinson's disease. I'm more four, um, divorced, and uh, yeah, I've been a fierce advocate ever since. I, since uh, for two years, have now been the vice chair of Radiolog, which is the rare disease organization in Belgium, because in our country, Belgium, um, young onset Parkinson's disease is recognized as a rare disease. Thank you for joining us, Feli. We look forward to your perspective in this. And Rodolfo, who are you? Hello. Hello, hi. I'm Rodolfo Savica. I'm one of the consultants on neurology at the Mayo Clinic Rochester. And I'm leading the effort on the young onset uh, Parkinson's disease clinic. And my own lab works on most of your young onset Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Rodolfo. And Sarah, tell us about yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Sara Vandres. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Laboratory of Neurogenetics at the National Institute on Aging at NIH in the United States. And I focus my research on young onset Parkinson's disease genetics. Thank you so much. So going into this webinar, I thought the concept of young onset Parkinson's disease was going to be pretty easy to define. And we've been meeting for about half an hour before this webinar. And I realized I was wrong. And you're going to hear why I was wrong and how I was wrong when we ask the first question, what is meant by young onset Parkinson's disease? I'm going to let Rodolfo and maybe Bart start this discussion. And rather than going on for an hour, which we could do, we're going to limit it a little bit, but you'll see how complex it is and why. So, yeah, sure. Um, so the concept of young onset Parkinson's disease lays upon the fact that everybody that is having the onset of disease before the common, more common age of, of Parkinson's disease onset, which is about 65 to 70 years of age, can be potentially considered young. Um, in other words, everything that happens before the cutoff of age was in the past considered young onset. And it's, I think this concept still stands as a whole. But that's why sometimes it's better to go in, a, in this situation if you think 65 and below early onset because it's earlier than the common, the most frequent age of onset of Parkinson's disease. However, the concept of young lays upon the fact that the individuals that are affected by this condition before the common, uh, the most common, the most usual age of onset are usually younger individuals, are usually people that are working in the working force, they're having their own life, they're having their own problems as we all have. Uh, they have family, they have kids, uh, they have boyfriend, girlfriend, they're having a whole life that they had to consider. And it's not 
happening toward the end of our active life in, our, in the Western society. The problem is that is very difficult from a research standpoint if we scout the literature, if we browse the literature, identifying a clear age of cutoff of age for this condition. There are uh, um, organizations that are thinking, rightfully so, uh, that uh, for below 40 years of age, below 45 years of age, um, it's indeed the group of patients called young onset Parkinson's disease. But I would argue with that, that somebody that is 51 can be incredibly young, you know, can be incredibly active, uh, fit, able to work toward their life and having 10, 15, 20 years of employment, of uh, activities that he or she would like to do. So, Many societies now are trying to identify a cutoff, a age cutoff, and we were talking half an hour before. We will never come with a with a clear <laughs> understanding and a clear agreement. So we have to try to find a way. But would be fair to say that everybody that is a, a biological age considered young for our society, which would be before the common. Uh, usual way of onset of Parkinson's disease can be considered earlier and, or younger. And maybe there's a population that has uh, uh, the onset in their 20s, 30s, that are younger or juvenile. Maybe that would be a way to, you know, make everybody happy. Why this is important? Why this is important from a standpoint of nomenclature and terminology is not just semantic, because to me, it doesn't matter if I call something a cow or a sheep is still an animal that I have to deal with. But my problem is that when we look at the literature, if we don't have a clear cut off of the age, it's very difficult to understand what are we talking about? How can we identify trends? How can we see if the population is increased or decreased? And even in terms of biomarker studies, genetic studies, there's a different meaning we will see maybe it's later if we are looking at genetic tests in someone in their 20s and 30s, and even treatments, 20s and 30s and 40s, compared to somebody's close to 60 or in their 60s. So there are some clinical and some research um, questions that need to be identified. But again, that is a gigantic work, and we are not going to be able to find that definition. I would say, to me, everybody that is considered young either by society or by themselves can be considered young onset. There's people that are way younger than the others, but still um, the implications are similar if somebody is in his middle 40s or early 50s or middle 50s sometimes. Dr. Post, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But it sounds like you're saying the most important reason that this concept exists is for research and for maybe clinical treatment guidelines. I Bart, think do you so. agree? Well, yeah. Sure. Well, yeah. Uh, I agree, most part with Rodolfo. I think uh, in clinical practice, I like to exclude the the case of juvenile Parkinson, and we use the cutoff of around twenty or twenty one. Maybe Sarah can say something about it later on. Uh, but what we what we know, and I wrote a, a paper about it together with Victor Fu when I was in Sydney. And what we, what we saw there is that a lot of young, of, of juvenile cases are other diseases, are all sure. kinds of metabolic diseases, and are not really, they don't really have the pathology of, of PD. So that's why we use the cutoff here in the Netherlands around 21. It's juvenile, it's other diseases. And then 21 and above, and we say between 40 and 50, but that's really a cutoff for the research. And because that's the group of around five to ten percent of all PD patients. So it's it's a small smaller group with its own questions in clinical practice. But I agree for 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 research we, we make this cut up for clinical practice we 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 do the same as Rodolfo. I agree with the fact that juveniles should be considered differently because obviously somebody in his twenties or in the teens usually is a different condition or something that can look like Parkinson, but is not necessarily Parkinson. So am I hearing that juvenile is before 20, just for today, 
and then oh, yeah, the onset sure. might be uh, uh, before the age of 40 or 50, somewhere around there. I, Something yeah, like Yes, okay, yes. So, uh, of course, it has importance for, for understanding the disease, which I think you both mentioned, but, uh, and you also mentioned that it is important in how the disease impacts the people in Vela. Do you want to say something about being diagnosed as a young onset person? What sort of challenges do you think you have and have had that perhaps a person who's 70 wouldn't have from the same disease? Um, I feel young onset because everyone I talk to and I explain about my disease tells me it's my, oh yes, my mom or my grandma has it. And that's when you stop relating and that's when you and it impacts us differently. Because I'm still at working age, I was building up my life. It impacts your relationship, it impacts your work, it impacts your social life. And I think that's a, a, that's, um, a big difference with the regular Parkinson's because the people with, with all due respect who are 17, 80, they can do with their sentiment for the rest of their lives. As young ones at Parkinson people, we can't. We have still too many years to go and there's so, so many misconceptions that impact our life negatively that I was so happy to read the article of Bart Post with the clear um, definition of the um, young onset Parkinson's disease. And, and one question, just to let everybody know we're getting these questions. Somebody says here, uh, it's somebody called Claire Lee, Lehman. Uh, it's a real challenge to determine how to balance career aspiration with trying to minimize stress. And any recommendations? And I, I, I think that's a great question because of somebody who's 70, already retired, yes. uh, financially, doesn't have to worry, yep. totally different, right? May, may not have any children they need to take care of. So, um, Vela, do you want to comment on that? What, what, what yes, could I be think, the best way? Is um, there a I way? I completely agree with that because um, how, much, how much I relate to older people with Parkinson's, I mean, they're talking about not being able to go on a ski holiday with their grandchildren. For me, it's about being there for my kids who I can't drive or go and pick up from parties um, because I can't drive a car anymore. It's about feeding them in the morning because I can't get out of bed. Um, it's about not being able to work anymore because I'm too nervous to go through a, an interview. It's those basic things that make a big difference. And it's also, yeah, you don't have a, the future you have in front of you is entirely different because I have to live day by day. So. Uh, and many people, of course, are in childbearing age and, and uh, might want to have a child, not don't already have a child. And uh, what are your thoughts around this? And maybe Rodolphe and Bart could mention how the treatment could impact uh, pregnancy and what one has to think about or not think about. Absolutely. Go ahead, Vela, first. Vela, what, what? Yes, well, we see now more and more in the online uh, groups where I'm a member of more and more people who become younger and younger or, or women who have um, kids at later age, um, wanting still to go through uh, pregnancy. Um, and, and there's so much still unknown about the subject. It's like a Pandora's box you open, you know, just don't start to talk about women and hormones. Although when we share our, that's the good thing about uh, on social media, we share our experience and we find our likes with people go through the same things. Because we are rare, each and each individually, but we are such a nice large group um, on the whole, on a global level. And there's a, a comment here from somebody that is a young onset person, you may actually be taking care of kids or wanting to have kids, but you may also be the caretaker of uh, your parents uh, if, when they are elderly. So that's particularly challenging. Rodolfo, you do want to say something about the uh, impact of treatments or no Absolutely. impact of the treatments on pregnancy? Absolutely. And I would like to preface saying also that uh, one of the challenge that all my patients with early onset, young onset Parkinson mentions is that they, as was told by Verle, they cannot relate very well with people in their 70s or 80s and 90s. And they, that's, that's why they don't have any, enough information. There's not support group that will match their needs because clearly somebody in his 80s and 90s already lived their life, uh, let me pass the term, lived their life, uh, cannot relate with somebody as young and in needs of a different kind of support and help, including the childbearing age, including having children. And actually, we were talking just, I think, one week ago with Dr. Post about 
uh, you know, try to explore more this topic. Because if you ask me, if my patients are asking me, and Bart can tell you the same, okay, I have Parkinson's disease. I'm in my 30s or 40s. I want to have a kid. I'm getting married in six months. This has happened to a patient of mine. I'm getting married in six months. And then I want to have a kid. I'm 32. Can I have a kid safely? Can I use uh, medication safely? Can I use uh, carbidopa levodopa safely or dopamine agonist safely? The answer to this question is simply we do not know. The answer is that uh, the literature is full of holes. That's why uh, having these initiatives like today and uh, some of the societies scientifically are trying to finally move, uh, getting a momentum out of this to try to, to fill the gaps that uh, our patient, then as Verla say, now is a rare disease, but thank God to social media, we are able to connect people from different parts of the world that can share the experience and can get a much larger crowd in front of them, not the only case in a group of uh, el elderly people. So from a childbearing standpoint, the question is that we really don't know and we need to, and maybe Bar can comment on that, I cannot decide by case, uh, being incredibly careful, uh, being saying, okay, if you had to take cinema, maybe let this continue, let's see the first three months of your doing and uh, maybe go on. Um, I'm talking to a yeah. lot of mat maternal federal specialists on that, but even them, they don't have a yeah. great uh, opinion on that. Bart. Well, well, we can say something about it. There, there are some reviews, but I agree with Rodolfo that literature is scarce and it's all case-based. But when you look at the reviews, what we see is that Parkinson's is, for the most most patients, is uh, they, they get worse during pregnancy. And then after pregnancy, they get a little better again. So at least you think it's hormones. And we, we, we looked at all the medication and I think of all the dopaminergic medication, it's the safest to use levodopa. If you don't have to use anything, that's even better. But if you have to use something, then use levodopa. And I want to uh, make two final comments. I think it's very important to get a gynecologist on your team. We have a gynecologist on our team. And as he's dedicated to Parkinson's, not only, but for one day in a week, she will be dedicated to Parkinson's and join our team as he can do research and we can, um, we, can, we can use her knowledge about women and about the hormones and about some tricks also with, with oral contraceptives to stabilize um, the Parkinson's. So we, have, we, we already uh, having fun of, of her, uh, it is her, um, of her expertise. That's and, actually and a, a question, uh, Bart, in the in the chat yeah. about hormone therapy. So contraception or uh, other uh, female sex hormone therapies, how much is known about how they impact the fluctuations in response to L-dopa or do they impact well, the response well, to L-dopa? Well, we, we don't know that. We don't know that. What we know, what I know from literature is that uh, women more often have dyskinesia uh, earlier on in, 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 uh, in the disease. I don't know why that is. So maybe Sarah can some, say something about it later on. Maybe it's a genetic thing uh, we know about. Um, and, and the other thing is what we hear is that a lot of patients, women, are uh, during their periods are worse off with their, with their PD. And sometimes we give oral contraceptives just to postpone or just eradicate the, the periods and then the, the, the PD will stabilize. So, but it, that's case-based, of course, it is no that's much, actually, not so uh, much. That's a question that you had, I think it says here from Michelle Flanagan, has Bart ever changed medication around menstrual cycles? But you mean you have then given medication to eliminate the cy cyclicity and you say case-based, it might case be based. a good idea, but never study. Case-based, yeah. And then what, 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 one last thing I want to say is that Rodolfo, I, and, uh, and uh, a Scottish colleague, Kathleen Pearl, we are working on, uh, on trying to get a database, like a registry for women all around the world to register their pregnancy and see how they do during pregnancy. And uh, we hope to gather more information about it this way. If you allow me to say another thing about hormones, because that is very important, and we know how hormones have been studied 
through the years for the generation with dementia, with Parkinson and so forth. One, there are some very small studies, mostly on basic science, that shows that on how circulating estrogen misplace or so detach the L-DOPA transported in the blood uh, um, during when taken. So in other words, sometimes women need to be taken a little bit more L-DOPA, for example, if they have a surge of hormone. That's why there's some literature suggesting that dyskinesia is more common in women because of the amount of circulating estrogens that they have. However, it's based upon very limited studies. So we really hope that we're gonna get more information and more studies to understand this very important topic that everybody, you say women, I say women for sure, but also men are having a little bit of fluctuation of hormones. They need to be studied as well. For sure women, but, all, but everybody affected, I would say. So I see Vela was nodding ahead. And before I see if you want to make a comment, Vela, I'm just gonna let everybody know we, we are soon going to discuss a little bit about the causes perhaps being different in young onset Parkinson's and we're going to discuss genetics. Uh, but perhaps, Vela, do you want to make a comment that there aren't no, she doesn't want to make comment, that's fine, Vela. you can come back later. But I'll just make the comment, it sounds like young onset Parkinson's hasn't been studied enough when it comes to several things in terms of uh, interaction with sex hormones, and as we're going to speak also later, uh, a slightly different response to medication in the long term and a slightly different clinical course. But before we talk about the clinical course, we have two questions I want to bring up. One is from Christopher Moga. He says, my son was diagnosed at 26. I'm interested in whether young onset implies a common group of causes different from older onset PD. And I'm also interested whether that offers routes for treatment for cure in addition to symptom management. And the other question is somewhat related. It's, um, oh gosh, there's so many questions now, I lost it, but it was one related to the genetics. Here we are, uh, where did it go? Well, I'll find it later, but it, it's, I'm gonna call on you, Sandra. Can you provide some clarity? People with young onset PD, are they different in terms of genetic causes? Are there more inherited cases in young onset PD? What do we know about genes in that case? And what's the difference between a familial form and one just being caused by lots of genetic risk or being with contributions from lots of genetic risk? So you're gonna speak a lot about this, I think. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Patrick. I think I will start talking a little bit about genetics and the genome in general for people that are not familiar with it. So just uh, for you to know, our genome contains information, of course, about what we are in terms of you know physical characteristics, of course, but also in terms of, of susceptibility of diseases, no? And in this case, um, young onset Parkinson's disease. So our genome is tremendously large. So it contains like about three billion tiny letters, right, that contains basically the instructions, everything uh, we need to determine like how every cell of our organism uh, should work. Um, um, based on that, you can imagine how much uh, information is within our DNA, right? Our genomic information comes like half from our mom and half uh, from our dad. And definitely genetics plays a key role in young onset Parkinson's disease. But I have to say that it was not until, um, you know, long, very, uh, long, very, uh, long time ago that um, uh, researchers and clinicians thought that Parkinson's disease was not a genetics uh, disorder. And, I have to say that our understanding of, of the genetics uh, underlying Parkinson's disease has grown incredibly over the last 20 years. And we now know that there are you know, several genes that are obviously responsible for young concept Parkinson's disease in which there are, I would say, rare and very deleterious uh, genetic variants that um, uh, cause disease by altering different biological pathways. And, um, in the case of young onset Parkinson's disease, I will say that there are genes that are linked to autosomal uh, recessive pattern of inheritance, which in that, you have people, to explain that. Yes, which in easy. So what is recessive? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm about to explain that. So in easy words means that uh, basically you have to inherit a mutated copy from your mom and another mutated copy uh, from your dad to develop disease. 
and um, if you do not inherit both, it will not cause disease. So this is the recessive pattern of inheritance. This means that your parents are um, carriers for those um, mutated copies, but they do not uh, present with the disease. And this is the case for some genes, like for instance, PAR2, PING1, or, or DJ1 that are responsible of uh, young onset Parkinson's disease. And then, of course, we have uh, autosomal dominant inheritance, which means that if you inherit one mutated copy, uh, this is enough to cause disease. And this is what we observe, for instance, in synuclein, the uh, SNCA gene that engulfs uh, synuclein is the main a histopathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease, and uh, is also, you know, a point mutations in this gene uh, cause young onset Parkinson's disease. So yeah, there are uh, definitely differences in how we inherit these variants and, and how these uh, cause disease. And regarding your second question, uh, the genetics underlying late onset Parkinson's disease or uh, sporadic disease and young onset Parkinson's disease is really different. Um, we say that in fact, Parkinson's disease etiology lies more on a continuum, right? That goes from Mendelian inheritance, which is these monogenic forms of disease that I have just, just described. And that occurs in a very small proportion of, of uh, forms of disease, of Parkinson's disease. Um, this, as I said, is caused by very, very deleterious uh, mutations in regions of the genome that are going to be uh, highly functional, uh, are going to be crucial for a certain uh, molecular pathway. And then we have uh, some other uh, type of uh, inheritance that is the, the complex inheritance that is what is uh, contributing to late onset Parkinson's disease. And this is more thought to be caused by, you know, an interplay. Uh, between a large number of genetic variants that individually are going to uh, uh, slightly increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. And these are- Sorry, just... can I interrupt you there, Sarah? When you yeah. say a large sure. number, so you as a geneticist, how many genes are you thinking of could be contributing to this genetic risk? Yeah, so so far there are about 90 uh, risk loci, so 90 independent signals that have been associated with uh, late onset Parkinson's disease or sporadic disease. And these are the ones that are uh, predisposing to disease. If you inherit one, nothing happens because they uh, um, exert a small effects on disease, but when uh, they are uh, uh, Just to, to give us a sense, that small effect. So tell the audience, so if you if you don't have that risk, locus yourself versus having it how much does your risk typically increase if you take an average risk locus one of those 90. Yeah, so that's, they exert like 1.02 times more likely to develop a disease. So it's really, really small for each of those particular variants, but when they accumulatively, they can increase risk up to sixfold. Uh, so it's uh, quite a lot when considered cumulatively and also uh, when you are exposed to certain environmental factors at the same time. And I've, you know, I've heard that those uh, risk loci are not necessarily, or typically not in the genes, but they're in areas that regulate genes. So if you have 90 of those locations, how many genes, just to give people a, a sense of how complicated this is, how many genes could be affected by those 90 loci? Yeah, so many, many of them. So uh, we are uh, actually trying to unravel uh, those signals around those loci because these are usually intergenic. These are in the genome. Uh, sometimes we do not exactly what are the causal variants. This is something that uh, that's why geneticists like work a lot with uh, cell biologists and, and we try to integrate our work in, in order to unravel the cause. But uh, there are definitely many, many genes that can be within a certain locus that is a region of the genome. So yeah, many, many small contributors. So I can tell the audience here that Sarah is one of the most prominent people in the world doing this. Uh, and you do a lot of complicated mathematics to understand this. It's, it's not just uh, Gregor Mendel looking at a couple of beans that have different colors. Uh, it's yeah. very, very complicated math. So you, you're a bioinformatician now rather than a person who, who looks at simple inheritance. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually wanted to go back to one of the questions. Um, I think it was mentioned about this kinesia. So we actually try to connect genotypes to phenotypes in Parkinson's disease, but this is really a big challenge for us 
And, and we do not have many answers yet, I have to say, because to study these unique patients that have been followed by many, many years, so you need a lot of data with the standardized clinical measurements. And the problem is that even if you have that data, that longitudinal data, because of course there are initiatives that are very promising, uh, there is a lot of clinical heterogeneity, as, as is, it has been mentioned at the beginning as well, right? Between those, those patients to kind of tease apart what variants are associated specifically with certain phenotypes uh, versus other, like in, in Parkinson's disease. And we got a very specific question from Rochelle Flanagan again. And I think it's for you, Sarah. Could you say approximately what percentage of young onset Parkinson's is genetic? And I presume the question is then monogenetic familial. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think this is a great question. So actually, there has been a recent study and um, found that about 65% of uh, people with Parkinson's disease onset under 20 years old, and about, I think it's 32% of, of people with onset between 20 and 30, uh, 30 years are affected by a non-rare uh, deleterious genetic uh, cause. However, I would like to say uh, there are many cases that certainly we know are genetic due to their family history, uh, but the genetic cause underlying is, is unknown yet for us. And, and there is definitely a lot to be found in terms of, of genetics, and this is what uh, we call the missing heritability of disease, right? There is a lot of genetic variation that is nowadays tricky to uncover, uh, just because of the current technologies that we have that are very difficult, uh, I mean, are, are tricky to kind of unravel rare variation, structural variation, and, and uh, different, uh, you know, genetics that, that are underlying um, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, with young onset. So, Vela, as somebody who is affected by young onset Parkinson's, what are the thoughts in the community about genetic testing, specifically for people with young onset? I think, yeah. Oh, sorry, is it? Yeah, sorry. I think it would be good as the cost of whole genome sequencing, sequencing is coming down um, that people who are diagnosed as young in their young ages are getting tested um, together with the help of obviously genetic counseling because the, the test itself doesn't ring a bell. But I think it's a good starting point to see and to start off further. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. The thing is that only a small proportion of patients with young onset Parkinson's disease nowadays have like an identical, uh, like a genetic cause that can be identified, right? Yes. So uh, the, the confusion here comes when, when a genetic test comes like negative and the patient says, um, you know, okay, so the cause of Parkinson's disease here is, is not a uh, genetic and this is always not, not true because uh, it might be just that your genetic cause has not been uh, discovered yet, you know? And this sometimes leads to confusion. So I agree with what you've said, like I would say that genetic testing should be uh, available, but only if it's followed by proper uh, genetic counseling, for sure. And we have a question, maybe Bart, you could tackle this. Uh, do you, can, well, we know actually, but can you describe how young onset Parkinson's disease presents differently uh, to the classical uh, Parkinson's disease in older age? And of course, with the genetic makeup of the disease being different, that's understandable, but can you describe how do patients typically progress in young onset and how do they respond to medication? And Rodolfo, you're also welcome, of course, in this. Yeah, I can say something about it. First, I want to say a little thing about genetic testing because in the Netherlands, we have rules for it. So I think it's, it's different everywhere around the world. So in the Netherlands, it's under 40, we can offer it. And if there is a first grade family member, then we offer it and we offer a panel of, uh, of several genes and we screen them. So we don't do whole exome sequencing most of the time only in research. And then on to the clinical things. Well, well what's, what's really, different, I think, when we, on presentation is that you see a lot of dystonia. Of course, PD is uh, bradykinesia, rigidity on one side, slowly progressive, uh, but you see a lot of dystonia. And I think around 20 to 30% of young onset patients, as opposed to older onset patients like 65 or 70, it's only 5% at, at the beginning. So a lot more dystonia, even exercise-induced dystonia as the first symptom especially when, when doing sports. Um, we do a lot of cycling in the Netherlands, of course, and we have patients, they can't cycle anymore because their, their foot is, is in, inverted. 
And um, well, and then then um, reaction to to medication. Well, in, we give levodopa to all ages. Uh, I don't know how it is in the other parts of the world, but we we left a dopamine agonist for young onset patient as first choice. I want to say first choice because we start with levodopa, we go low and slow to treat Can it. you just explain uh, why you chose not to start with uh, dopamine yeah. agonists? Yeah, yeah, I can explain. Um, we, we, we switched recently, and, it, and one of the important things is the LEAP study. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine two years ago. And what we saw there, if even in young patients, if you start really early with levodopa, you get a good response. And what we are afraid of in levodopa is dyskinesia. And dyskinesia is, is, um, is it, it, you see it more often in younger patients, but you see it mostly driven by disease duration. So, and, and if you give agonist, they're more, less effective. The levodopa is more effective. So we, we choose in the beginning for low levodopa, because that's the best way of treating patients for a good quality of life. And in the end, when, when you get this wearing off, then we add the dopamine agonist. And one other, one other issue that that's why we use uh, levodopa first is the impulse control disorders. You see them, uh, especially in young men, you see them much more often up to 20% and lifetime prevalence around 50. So that's, that's another important reason. So on one side, levodopa is more effective and you have to impulse control this more often in, in, in the dopamine acne. So that, that's the, the most important two reasons to, to start levodopa, even if you're in your 20s and in your 30s, but stay low, go slow. And then one last thing before I hand it over to Rodolfo about prognosis, because what we know from literature, and that's really typical, I don't know how to explain it, but we see a much slower progression in young onset patients. So without doubt, uh, patients who have 30 years of, of Parkinson's, they're all, they started in their, their 20s and in their 30s. And um, I don't know what happens there, but it, it's there. We call it the paradox of getting young onset because you don't want to be, um, you want to, don't want to live for 40 years with, with this disease. But on the other end, you don't want to progress in 10 years to, to really be um, disabled. So that's, that's what I have to say about these topics. So the disease progresses more slowly, the responses to drugs slightly different, and we heard from Sarah that genetics are different. In fact, I have a very specific question as we go over to Rodolfo, and this is maybe you can answer for your clinic, it may a clinic very specialized, but what proportion of young onset Parkinson's actually undergo genetic testing? Do you have a feeling for that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I would say to answer this question, I would say in my personal clinic, personal, in our Mayo Clinic, that is a, we have a very broad, multidisciplinary, almost holistic approach where we have many different figures. We have sport medicine, integrative medicine involved, genetic counseling. Every patient that comes to my clinic, they're undergoing two genetic tests. Usually is a commercial available test that is about 16 genes and most of my patients are negative. So then we have to do the, the, the whole genome sequences, as, as Dr. Paul says, and Albert Berle says, it's mostly for research, but it's the way to understand that, as Dr. Bandresiga was saying, if somebody is genetically negative for this commercial available test, doesn't mean that the genes are not involved. It means that these genes that are the most common causative genes that are causing the disease are not positive, but, the role of genes is way complicated and Dr. Banasiga made a very good summary of that. But also another thing that we have is that we don't know about the protective genes. We know nothing about protective genes. We don't know how much protective genes are interacting with the risk factor genes and on how the sex chromosomes X, X and Y are having a role into that, which is a major failure of the entire field, not just in Parkinson, but in many conditions. In other words, is very much, is much more complicated. Getting a negative test doesn't mean that you're negative, it means that we don't know yet what is gonna be happening in the future. And even having a positive test doesn't necessarily mean 
doesn't necessarily mean that the disease will be inevitable because there can be protective genes that are inactivate or block the gene to some extent. So it's much more complicated. That's why we have this more comprehensive approach to try to look at different level, the complexity of this condition that is completely different than what we do in lead onset Parkinson's disease. I agree with Dr. Post. We use carbidopa levodopa because we need to help patients, as Verla say, now, day by day, in the now. We don't know what would happen in the future, but if somebody has diabetes that needs, that need, that needs insulin, we will give insulin. We will not give oral glycemic agents. It's not gonna work. So when some, we prefer to start low, as Dr. Post says, slow, avoiding control, impulse control disorder that are present in 30%, if not more, of patients that are using with Parkinson's disease. And you know, it's important to say, sometimes these impulse control disorder are not massive. They are not destroying your life. Sometimes they're very intrusive. They're like extreme hobbying. If somebody likes to read and reads nine hours per day, is a normal hobby, but it's becoming intrusive in the life. So it's very important to consider this a topic. I completely agree with Dr. Post. The entire idea is to incorporate to me the way I foresee this for the future for genetic testing, that every patient should be tested genetically, hopefully with a more comprehensive gene, hopefully with all genome sequences and all the effort of people that are involved with taking care of these patients should be holistic, multidisciplinary and harmonized. In fact, me and Dr. Post are working already in trying to harmonize our clinical efforts in two different continents in order to provide a homogeneous approach to the condition. So you use the word holistic and there's a question I think that touches upon this. The, the disease affects the whole family and we talked earlier about young onset Parkinson's patients being at a fertile age, may already have children. Uh, Velo, do you want to comment? Uh, there's a question. What support is there out there for young children who have a parent with young onset PD, especially regarding familial PD? Because as scientists, we want to know the genetic background and we'll find out that there's a gene that's related to young onset in this family, but there are no treatments that can stop it if it is inherited. So, so is there anything there, Vela? No, there is none whatsoever. And this is my, my main um, frustration because MS, uh, MS Association, other patient organizations, they support their um, families because it's normal for MS patients to have children of um, like teenager or young family. And for Parkinson's, there's none. So I really think we are now getting more and more focused on um, young onset Parkinson that there comes a movement where there's separate um, organ patient organization who help patients also in house settings, who help uh, also on different levels. We'll, we've started a survey, which will be global uh, survey, um, led by patients for patients. It will, I mean, more information, hopefully will follow soon. We are collaborating to that. And the aim is to get the support that is needed, which is only fair because there's so many, I mean, globally, there's so many people of us living with the disease and encountering the same problems where we don't get any help with. And I think it's interesting that there's always been a need for support for the whole family, but yes. with the young onset, uh, with the genetics, you add an additional level of complexity because yes. the, the children may then know that they're at a greater risk. And my dad was diagnosed when I was 13. And of course, in, in those days, there was no internet. So I didn't know of anybody else who, who had a father who had Parkinson's and there was no possibility to connect. Now, I think a, benef a, a good thing is that there are children's books about Parkinson's disease. Uh, Sonia Matur has written a couple I know. And, and you know, that can help explain to the children um, and provide some support. And, mm -hmm. But, but I want to come back to this issue. I think the discussion, I, I, I want to thank you all for this. And I want to thank the people asking questions because this is really interesting. But you've really painted a picture of a rather different disease in terms of genetics, different disease in the course of it, uh, the implications for the people affected because they're in an earlier phase in life, the way they respond to medication. And somebody pointed out very early on, shouldn't there be a special 
like a task force addressing young onset Parkinson's because it is such a different entity. And uh, I see people waving their hands off screen uh, and there is a task force, maybe. <laughs> uh, Bart, Rodolfo and Vela wanted to speak to this. Uh, what should be done in the future about young onset Parkinson's? Uh, and I want to add before we go there that we talked about the genetics through Sarah, it's, it's different, but we also know that if you look at the brain in the microscope, somebody who's passed away with young onset, the pathology isn't identical in many cases to the regular garden variety later onset Parkinson's. So definitely a different biology. But this task force, who wants to put up their hand if you want to talk about a task force? Rodolfo, go ahead, you start. Touch. Let me yeah. start for the last concept that is very important. So I think the major mistake that we did as a group, as a scientist, as a physician, was that we adopted knowledge of late onset Parkinson disease into the young onset Parkinson disease. The knowledge that we acquired through decades on late onset Parkinson disease may not apply or barely applies to early onset, to young onset Parkinson disease. Um, sometimes, so the entire idea is that, as you say, there are some conditions, there are some situations where the Lewy bodies, the accumulation of alpha synuclein is not even present. And the symptoms of the generation of the substantia nigra or damage of the substantia nigra, which is the area responsible for some of the symptoms, is a common outcome of many different conditions, of many different mechanistic biochemical mechanisms that can be caused by several different metabolic pathways that are driven by a genetic background, uh, driven by environmental background, driven by personal background to some extent. So clearly, we, as a group, we need to work together. We need to spearhead research. We need to have this kind of conversation helping foundation, NIH, UK, um, Brain Bank, Europe, Asia, doesn't matter, to, to fund research devoted to understand the subtype and the characteristic of early onset Parkinson's disease. Personally, I am the chair of the early onset Parkinson's disease task force of the movement of the society. Dr. Poss is part of that as well. And there was, a, there was a task force that didn't exist before. It just started now. To me, that is a kind of concerning because this means that up to this point, 50 years, 40 years in the revolution of Parkinson's disease, 20 years in the genetic revolution of the 90s of, uh, of uh, genome, and years in the idea of individualized medicine, we are not even considering, nobody has considered formally to this point, this condition that is inherently different biologically, mechanistically, and uh, you know, with patho pathologically, socially, personally, compared to the rest. And that is, to me, something that we had to work as a group. Maybe, you know, this conversation with Spearhead, additional conversation should we span more interest and would help identify funding mechanisms just devoted to early onset Parkinson's disease. And not just for my lab, for anybody's. We need to communicate. We need to make sure that as a society, taking advantage of the fantastic network of patients that Verle was mentioning here, we will be able to identify and include more people because ultimately we need to cure this problem. We need to cure this condition. And maybe we will not be able to cure everyone. Maybe we'll be able to cure just a percentage of patients that have a specific characteristic, but they would be a start. They would help understanding what is the condition and how can we apply this knowledge to other diseases. And so Rodolfo, have... you, you mentioned Vela here, and I know Vela, you're involved in a uh, survey that's being prepared ahead of the World Parkinson Congress that's mm -hmm. hopefully going to be held in Barcelona in 2022, if we get rid of this pandemic. Uh, and uh, you working with Bart on this questionnaire, fingers crossed yeah. that we can go there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the survey and, and how you think the people who are young onset PD can get involved? Um, well, it, it will be translated in all languages. It should be for everyone. It will be uh, distributed by patients, by the organization of WPC itself and the EPD as well. 
Um, and, but we are also, I mean, we normally your your uh, your pathway starts at when you get your diagnosis, and from there it starts. And what happened before is of no relevance. And we're really trying. We're we're still at the stage where we're thinking about to, how to ask the right question and what those questions are, in the what how they grew up, how people grew up, if there were any other illnesses um, that occurred. So. Um, I'm sure everyone who wants, because we it's a lot of work, we need lots of people, anyone who's interested or um, to participate in contact PLA to Parkinson's. But I'm so happy to hear Rodolfo and Bart Post about, um, we need to change how we deal with young onset. And it is a separate disease and we can only move forward by addressing that issue. And it's so important that to hear that we're slowly getting there. But if we all collaborate, I believe, between clinicians, researchers, patient advocates, patient organizations. I'm sure things will change soon and it gives me lots of hope. Thank you. And Bart, do you want to add to that? Yeah, what I really liked about the survey is that it started with the patient. It's coming from the patient. It's the patient's perspective that we are looking at. And we have so, several uh, well, professionals who, who come in and add their view. And together we have a nice survey, I think. So it will be interesting from a more well, scientific point of view. What are the important problems? Are there any prodromal things different in young onset, for example? For example? But especially the impact. And uh, I'm really looking forward to get the data about the women part, because that's really an area of underserved area. So, but especially the, the initiative coming from the patients and then the professionals joining in, I really love that. And uh, well, I think we, we're gonna make a, a nice survey and we hope to present the data in uh, Barcelona. I think it's only by collaborating with all the different stakeholders that we're gonna get a change and it's so needed. It feels like 50 years ago, people died from cancer, whether it was lung cancer or brain cancer. Um, now. It's by defining those subtypes that you get results. And I think the same will happen with Parkinson's. Because there's so many unknowns, also for the regulars. By looking at us, we can still, I mean, if we're not too nervous, we can still express what we, what we experience. And by doing that, we will get uh, to the right target. Yeah, and I would like to add something about that point, Bill. I think is is great. Uh, I believe that really uncovering the genetic causes and the lying young onset Parkinson's disease has been really key to unravel molecular pathways associated with disease. So there is hope there. And for instance, I, I have the example, some success has been seen in, in regard with the autosomal uh, recessive genes that I mentioned, like part yeah. two, pin one, DJ one that uh, are, you know, set a common molecular uh, pathway that is the mitochondrial quality control, for instance, you know, and, and regulation. And this, I think, has really important implications for drug development um, in the sense that, you know, if you know that this pathway is clearly affecting uh, young onset Parkinson disease, you are going to work on developing therapeutic strategies that are going to correct that underlying cause rather than the symptoms, you know, that is what we have at the moment. And, you know, there are many variations of Parkinson's disease or flavors of disease, as uh, Rodolfo was pointing. And, um, you know, in that sense, we need to, to look at the disease from different perspectives. And when you look at the disease from the molecular perspective, it's, it's certainly different. And, and this is important as we start thinking about um, uh, precision and personalized medicine, of course. And that's a great point, Sarah, because of the studies partly coming out of the Canadian teams where they've seen in animal models of young onset disease that uh, infections can trigger the disease mechanism if you have these Parkinson mutations. And, and your own work, Sarah, not just in young onset Parkinson's, but in general Parkinson's, implicating that somehow the immune system is involved. Maybe you could share your paper from about 10 months ago. What were the main molecular pathways that seemed to be important? Yeah, so we perform like a large scale and biased approach to study the cumulative effect of multiple pathways on uh, disease risk, on Parkinson's disease. And we saw that the innate uh, immune response, and well, we saw different, and we managed to uh, prioritize some targets by using different algorithms and met methodological approaches. And uh, there are definitely uh, a lot of candidates there that are, um, you know, involved in, in the immune response from, from different perspectives. So 
uh, this is definitely something to, to further study. Yeah. So that survey uh, for the World Parkinson Congress upcoming 2022 in Barcelona, that survey could be important also in gathering information about other things that affect the risk that are environmental. You mentioned other diseases, Vela, I think will be in the survey. Do you want to add to that, Vela? Yes, also, we will also ask the patients what they themselves think might have been the cause of their Parkinson's. And I think that has never been asked before, but that's a valid question that, is, that doesn't come into the clinical practice. So asking the patients what they think uh, cause them, because obviously for ourselves, we might know, we might have an idea, but it's unfunded, but we, and, and by getting those answers to a question like that, it might change a view and something That's else. Yes. Well, we sometimes don't appreciate how important uh, just regular clinical observation can be for research. And one example is the discovery of one of the greatest genetic risk factors for Parkinson's, which is the GBA mutation, was discovered by a pediatrician who saw that there were many people in the waiting room of her waiting room, uh, Ellen Sidransky. She was treating young people with Gaucher's disease, there weren't many relatives who seemed to have Parkinson's disease in the waiting room. And that started a long process. And, you know, clinical observation can sometimes be very, very important in, in, the, in the most odd ways. All right, let me just, we're, we're coming to a close soon, but I want to bring up a couple of questions that have come in the chat. Those questions we couldn't answer, we'll try to get back to you, maybe post some articles on the website. Uh, this whole webinar will be on YouTube later, and you can see it there whenever you want to. Um, and I think there are lots of questions about L-DOPA and what's a low dose and so on. I think we can probably find good review articles there. But let me just highlight another question that came up. Exercise and young onset Parkinson's. I heard Bart said that the dystonia that is associated with young onset Parkinson's can be troublesome if you're a cyclist. Now, only a Dutch person would bring that up, but uh, are there other forms, or oh, Belgian, sorry, I know the Belgians are good at cycling, but are there other forms of exercise uh, that you think might be beneficial in, in specifically in young, oh, sorry, Italians are good at cycling too. I see Rodolfo, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> and, and Spaniard, we have the cycling nations in front of us, the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, and Spain. But are there yeah. other forms of exercise also you could recommend? Do you think that there is some tentative evidence could be good in young onset Parkinson's? Yeah, what, what we what we we wrote a, we, we did a, an RCT here in our group together with Bas Bloom because he's really into exercise, as a lot of you know. And um, what we showed is that aerobic exercise um, three times a week for that like forty five minutes, so really raising your heart rate. Uh, but don't get anaerobic, so don't get your your your. Uh, well, we, we call it in Dutch versuring. Um, I don't know the I don't know the English word. Uh, th that's what you should do, and then the motor symptoms are getting better. But that's not only for young onset; that's also for all PD patients. So that's what we recommend to all our patients um, on 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 exercise, and they don't have to be cycling. You can do a rowing. You can do walking you can do running but you should get your heart rate up and you should be there for for around 30 to 40 minutes and do it three times a week so that's what we say about exercise to our patients and that sounds uh, well, tough yeah yeah but it, it's still well pe people a lot of people they, they ask us what can we do and we say you can do three things look at your uh, look at the things you eat uh, exercise and, and and do something about stress and uh, so how to manage stress yeah, yeah. So, so i'm going to stress you now because we have one minute 45 seconds to go and we yeah had a suggestion <laughs> want to do tango so each one of you you can say one word or maybe three words to respond to this question from one of our listeners what would be the most impactful action that the young onset Parkinson's disease community could take collectively to benefit research and accelerate a cure? One thing, that's a challenge. Go ahead, Vele. Collaborate. Collaborate. I would say collaborate, three words. Collaborate, advocate, in many different order, advocate, collaborate, and push push foundation, push governments, push agency 
to the vote. Lobby. Correct. Yeah. I wouldn't, I even to say lobby. I say push, but lobby. And Sarah, Sarah, what do you say? You're not allowed to say sequence. Yeah, I mean, I will be a little bit more specific and I will say join the Global Parkinson's Disease Genetics Initiative by donating your sample and, and in getting involved because uh, we, need, we need your collaboration, your cooperation to study your genetics and to see what are the pathways underlying disease. So, so donate, so donate DNA. Donate, donate. Uh, and Bart, and you're not allowed to say cycle, Bart. I say registry. So registry. We should, yeah, we should. We, we need a registry for young onsets. Okay. We have five seconds. I want to thank you all. This was great, a great discussion. And I hope we can all meet in some other context in real life soon. If not soon, at least in Barcelona 2022 at the World Parkinson Congress. So thank you, everybody, and to everybody listening and asking questions. Bye-bye. Thank, bye. thank you to our sponsors.